In this video, I'm going to continue talking about solving um, E equals fleet questions. I'm going to start with probably the hardest question. So this is from before the current syllabus. Um, 2008, question 14, B, part 2. Unfortunately, there's no answers uh, for this anyway, so whatever we say today is going to be the answer. Um, the data that we've been given is here. So the question says there's a single strand of cable. Now, it's really important. I have had questions where I could not get the multiple choice correct, and then I went back and I realized it said three, not the, right? So really important. Um, that's something that has caught me out. So be really careful with these sorts of questions. Think, is it single cable? Because it, multi it might be multiple cables. If we have multiple cables, we multiply the area by those number of cables. Um, I think 2012 has a question like that. A single strand of cable is two millimeters in diameter. The uh, strand is loaded with a force of 1.5 kilonewtons. We're going to use newtons. Um, and the strand is, uh, sorry, the stress, the strain is this number. Now, when we say a quarter of a percent, you've got to remember that strain is a number, and so 1% is 0, 0.0, so 1% would be 0 0.01. So 0.25%, or quarter of a percent, is going to be written as that number. Are we all okay, all okay with that? Excellent, okay. Um, so, you could write uh, 0.25 and then divide by 100 to get that number. So what we need to do is, typically, we would, we would say that E equals flea. That's our formula for strain, right, um, for these sorts of questions, or Young's modulus, F equals flea. But what we actually need to remember here is that E is actually equal to stress over strain, and that stress equals, stress equals force over area and strain equals extension over length. So if they've not given us those that value, what we can then say here is that, um, you know what, I'm just going to rewrite that here. Um, strain is equal to force over area divided by this strain. So what that means is we're going to have to figure out our stress. Stress equals force over area, so we'll get 15 uh, 1.5 uh, kilonewtons, which is 1,500 newtons, divided by our area. So we need to know our area. So I'm going to go over here and figure out my area. I can see how uh, you know, my student who had done this working out for previously got into this sort of problem. Uh, so it's pi d squared on 4. So area is going to equal um, pi 2, 2 squared is 4. Divided by 4, so area is going to equal 3.14 something millimeters squared. It's going to be pi millimeters squared. So here we can substitute here 3.14. So our straight our stress is going to equal 477. 0.7 uh, megapascals. How do we know it's in megapascals? Because we use grease units. We go together like megapascals and millimeters squared. Just remember, we have to use newtons as the base base unit, otherwise we can get ourselves in trouble. Okay, so we've now got our stress, uh, sorry, uh, stress, and we can say stress over area. So E equals 4.77.7 divided by 0 0.0025 equals 199 gigapascals. 199 gigapascals. 91. Okay. Uh, now, is that a reasonable answer? Yes, it is. Right. So brass has, is 111. Uh, steel is 21. Uh, uh, so 210 gigapascals. So that's right in between those numbers. So it's a totally reasonable answer for this sort of question. So that is our answer for uh, question 14. I wish I'd laid it out a little bit better. I'm going to move some stuff around. Um, feel free to skip if you're watching this as a video. Okay, so we're going to write stress equals force over area, stress equals 1500 divided by 314 equals 477.7 megapascals, strain is, e sorry, Young's modulus is equal to force over area, 477.7 divided by 0 0.0025 equals, what was it? One. 191 gigapascals. Okay, so it's laid out better. Uh, 
taking a photo of that. Okay. So what we're going to go on to now is we're going to go through this question in um, 2015. Now this would be a better one if I could project onto the board, but I'll draw it very quickly. And I'm going to get some students to measure um, and give me some answers based on what they can see on their screens. So I've got a stress strain graph, and that's presumably going to be steel, based on the shape of it. We've been asked to identify uh, the three points labeled on this graph. So we have X, Y, and Z. Okay, so can someone tell me what X is? Extension. Yeah, but what, what oh, we call the that point? Bending point. Oh, there's a name for it. Okay, I will be honest, I'm a little bit concerned. Sorry. Um, okay, so there is a definite yield point. The definite yield point is this shape. We have an upper yield point and a lower yield point. If you wrote yield point, I would give that as correct. I don't, I, I don't, I didn't mark this question in the HSA, I can't say definitively, but I would give that as correct. But there's a better answer. This is where the elastic limit or the we probably is going to be, but it's where the proportional limit definitely is, right? It's where it ceases to be a straight line, where the gradient, right? Remember the Young's modulus is the gradient where the gradient ceases to be consistent. Can you say elastic right? limit? If you wrote elastic limit, I think that's better than the definite yield point. So in the hierarchy of answers, I would give definite yield point, or if you wrote yield, I would give that correct. If you said elastic limit, I like that better. Elastic limit is almost certainly there, especially for metal, right? Um, but what it is is the proportional limit. Now we've talked a little bit about how there is distinctions between those things. The proportional limit is where this line ceases to be a straight line, where the gradient is no longer consistent, right? The elastic limit is the point up until it behaves elastically, which for metals is almost always exactly the same point. For the definite yield point, that's this shape here, this curve, it means something we can easily read, it means it doesn't have progressive yield. We would say that it has an upper yield point and a lower yield point. And we could take a yield stress as being some factor of this. Right? We'd often use the term working stress, which is the allowable percentage of the uh, yield stress that we're allowed to use. Okay. A lot of time spent on that point X, but something that we don't really talk about a lot, and I'm glad to have somewhere where it's a resource where I've spoken about. Okay, we're now at point Y. What do we call that? Nice. Ultimate tensile strength. Right? You can think of UTS. If you're at UTS, I would give that correct. Right? In a trial, I would give that correct. I can't say the HSC market would give it correct. I would. This here is the... Snapping point. Yeah, snapping. I would pay snapping point. I would call it the breaking point. Break, yeah. But I would, I would pay snapping point. Okay. So that's this first part of the question. There is a second part of this question that I have to find. It says the original gauge, gauge length for a steel test piece was um, 55 millimeters with a cross-sectional area of uh, 6.9. So I'm going to have to change my data here and say, okay, so our, our diameter is now 9.6 mil. Oh, wait, no, we have an area. It's important that you make sure that you get your areas. Don't use an area instead of diameter. I have done that when marking papers, like marking trials, and I had to go back and remark things because I made a mistake. Um, steel test piece has an original length of, you know, I'm just going to start here. So it had a gauge length, that means L0, of um, 55. Now you don't need to write it as, 55, uh, um, as L0, you can just write it as L equals 55. I just like, that's what I used at uni, and that's what if I was doing this profession, I would use L0, just to give it a little bit more detail. It also reminds me that the, it's before the strength, before the stress. Um, okay, so using the data on the load extension graph, calculate the value of the Young, Young's modules. So, that graph that we had before, that is not actually a stress strain di diagram. What this in is in fact a load extension length, uh, uh, extension. So what it said is calculate the Young's modulus. That's what the question said, yeah? Calculate the Young's modulus. Okay, I, um, given that no one has disagreed with me, I'm gonna say that's correct. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this proportional limit. To be honest, we could use any way. Because we're just finding rise over run, we could take rise over run here, we could take rise over run there, we could take rise over run kind of anywhere. But I'll tell you where most people take rise over run, um, and relative to our question, most people would take it at this point here. And they've made it nice and easy for us to do that by giving us this value. They've told, they've, uh, they haven't given us that value, but it's very easy to calculate that it's 
eighteen. It's eighteen. Yeah, it's it's um. You can read off the graph and see that it's eighteen kilonewtons. So we're going to call um. Well, so the load is eighteen kilonewtons. Eighteen km. Okay, is the load. Uh, so it's F. Half a millimeter. And the extension at that location is half a millimeter. Delta L, or what we write as E, equals 0 0.5 millimeters. Okay, so from that, what let's we just type this in the calculation. So E equals F L over E A, which means if we know that F is 18 times uh, 10 to the 3 newtons, we probably always want to be using newtons, our original length was 55 divided by E, which is 0 0.5, multiplied by area, which is 9.6. Is that what you did? Yeah. And what number were you? 206.25 gigapascals. 206.5 gigapascals. 25? Yeah. Disappears. If it rounds down, it disappears. E equals 206 gigapascals. Now, in terms of um, the how much how many decimal places should you use? I don't like decimal places. I think three significant digits is acceptable for a working engineer. And we had an argument about that in um, <clears throat> when I was talking to some other HSC teachers. And I think that that stands. I think that there's not going to be many teachers who are going to mark you down for not giving uh, the precision of three significant figures. Do you think because they gave us 9.6, will we write... That's two significant figures. We're giving an answer that's accurate to three significant figures. So it's not the number of decimal places as far as I'm concerned. If you went four, four significant figures, I can't say that anyone could ever mark you as incorrect. Yeah? That's my opinion. Um, and I, I would think that any marker who did was wrong. Okay, I'm putting it out there, internet. Come fight me. I'm going to get Call from 48 the subscribers. Super, the supervisor of marketing is going to call me and say, Luke, what you said was wrong. Okay, um, questions for um, 2016. I'm just happy with this black marker. Uh, the following stress strain curves represent the, um, a test result showing the true stress and strain of, thermo of thermo softening polymer. Okay, I'm going to draw these uh, really quickly. So we've got this one, we've got this one, we've got this one, and we've got this one. Which one of these is a true stress? True is on the top of the top. Oh, they got you. It got you good. Oops. Right, so people went in there and said, I know what true stress looks like, so I probably should draw that. I think, it, yeah, uh -huh. it doesn't actually bend down. So, if it was like this, engineering stress for, looks like that, and nerds, scientists, they want to know the truth, right, the truth, they will actually go and measure the area every time, right? they like, stop the experiment, I've got to go measure, and the engineer's like, I just want to go home. But the scientists, they want to know the truth, so they keep measuring the area here, and then they measure the area here, and they measure the area here, and they keep measuring the area and doing new calculations and they plot a line of best fit. But, this is the true stress for steel. Whereas this would be an engineering stress for a polymer maybe, something like that. So it's D. It's D, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, you guys have the answers. If you look on, on Facebook, I've posted the answers. For some reason it won't show me the answers. But you guys could follow along because D! Good work. Thank you, mate. Okay. Okay, even though you were the one who got me the answer. Okay. So that was 2016. I'm glad we went through that because it looks like that was a easy question to get wrong. Okay, 2016, question 21. Ah, this is... You've got to get me both. Okay. So, a, uh, what we've got here is a 12... So, write my data sheet here. I'm going to say a... That's not how you do the diameter symbol. What about how I would hit the skip button already? I tell you, a 12 millimeter. So I know straight. Away, I'm going to write area now to remind me that I need to find the area. It's just it's a good process. So 12 millimeter diameter steel reinforcing bar. That's only one, right? It's not three of them. Was used um, in this seating module during a proof stress test. It just says proof test. A load of 26 kilonewtons. Equals 
26 km. So again, I'm writing that down now as 26 newtons. Um, extended. So just always check that they haven't given you a final length. Right? It's very common that they'll give you a final length and not the extension. You have to calculate the extension yourself. Equals 0 0.9 millimeters. Right? I'll just put in here that, that I also call that delta L. But you don't have to. Um, extended it by a mil. So you know the final length too, don't you? Oh, okay, great. It is extended a nine mil. Uh, sorry, okay, look at me. Nine reading. Okay. Mil. So reading the question, right? He'd look at me turning around saying, hey, reading the question is really important. So I'm like, wait, that doesn't make sense. And I'm, something has tweaked that why are they giving me this number as one millimeter? Luckily, they made it nice and easy. This is not the extension. Part of me is like, should I even edit his? But I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to own the fact that I, while I was reading the question, I could tell something was going on. So the original length is 0 0.9 meters, but we're going to use that instead. We're just going to say L equals 900 millimeters. And then delta L equals 1 millimeter. Okay, uh, calculate e, the Young's modulus. It was pretty easy. We spent more time writing down the data than we did anything else. It's just making sure that we get the right thing. So we've got 26, um, okay, we have to find the area first. Okay, area equals 12 squared pi on four, which is equal to 144, so 400, 400, about 3, it's like 150, 113. Uh, I will take an extra decimal place on that one. Okay. Thank you. So, let's plug those values in. What do we get? F equals 26 yeah. times L, which is 900, divided by E, which is 1 multiplied by 113.1, gives us. Now, I just want, while my calculators are calculating, I'm going to say that we're going to remind you that we're using millimeters because we want to get our answers. Our answer is going to be megapascals. Yep, what do we get? 206.9. 206.9. Now, I uh, just occurs to me all this time you have been converting that into gigapascals, right? Yes. Okay, so the actual answer we get is 2069, something like that. And that is in megapascals. My calculators have done such a good job that they've just been giving me the answers in gigapascals and they've been removing the, 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 the zeros. And I thought, you know what? Those people who didn't watch this part of the video, they're going to miss that detail. And so here I better explain it really clearly. So we're getting 206,000 megapascals because we go together like megapascals and millimeter squared, right? But E is measured in gigapascals. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.